I have to say, I have to say <laughs> that uh, after the RICO indictment, Mr. Trump and his comrades in Atlanta, you can go on YouTube and see Edward G. Robinson in the final scene yeah. of Little Caesar. Mother of mercy, yeah. is this the end of RICO? Right. I haven't seen that headline. Where, where are these journalists? Come on, come on. That's, that's a natural headline. So good afternoon, everybody. This is September 2nd, 2023. I'm here with Dr. Gerald Horn for episode seven of the DeFacto podcast. Welcome back, Dr. Horn. Thank you for being uh, here with us once again. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, just a note before we begin, I am recovering from a nasty bout of COVID. Oh. So you may hear that reflected in my voice a bit. And for that reason, I'm going to try to keep my questions and comments brief, not only to save my voice, but for the sake of listeners and viewers out there as well. But today, we're covering two texts, Dr. Horns. We've got class struggle in Hollywood, uh, 1930 to 1950, moguls, mobsters, stars, reds, and trade unionists which is University of Texas, uh, 2001, I believe. Then we've got the final victim of the blacklist, John Howard Lawson, Dean of the Hollywood 10, uh, University of California Press, 2006. I'd like to begin with uh, Class Struggle in Hollywood, Dr. Warren. The book is about labor conflict in Hollywood, which came to a head in 1945, 1946, between the CSU, that is the the Conference of Studio Unions, which was the more progressive union of craft laborers, painters, and carpenters, which confronted not only major studios, but also a competing union, that is the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, the IATSE. And, and your book details the downfall of the CSU, not least by studio moguls who were operating under the aegis of uh, organized crime, but perhaps most of all, because of this false allegation that the CSU was essentially operating as a communist front, which led directly to, into the, the Red Scare politics in Hollywood in the era and culminated as is well known in, in the, in the un, un House Un-American Activities Committee hearings in the 1940s and the Hollywood blacklist, which was the final nail in the coffin of, of progressive uh, unionism in Hollywood as you argue in the book. So my first question, it's kind of a two-part question. Why has this labor history been largely hidden from view beneath the glitz and glamour of Hollywood? And, and then also, what inspired you to undertake the excavation of this period? Well, the second question is easier to answer. Um, I began this project when I was on the faculty at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And I oftentimes advise younger scholars that for logistical purposes, purposes of expense, not least, that they seek to do research where they are. Because inevitably where you are, there are intriguing stories that need to be uncovered. So these Hollywood books are a product, not only of being in Southern California, but of course, uh, earlier, I had lived in Northern California, in Berkeley and San Francisco. So also uh, growing up in St. Louis, one of my preoccupations amongst others was watching movies on the late show <laughs> on television. And uh, I watched movies too numerous to mention and developed an interest in cinema as a result. And so uh, developing an interest in cinema, I began uh, decades ago to subscribe to cinema studies journals, uh, reading about cinema, et cetera. And then living in Southern California, I began working on the, a book on Watts, fired this time, the Watts Uprising in the 1960s. And through that project, I began to collaborate with the Southern California Library for Social Studies and Research 
which is in South Los Angeles. It was started by uh, former communists and actual communists uh, some decades ago uh, in the aftermath of August 1965. And some of the folks who started that independent library, which is still with us, by the way, and has a treasure trove of archives, many of them had been uh, film workers. And that's how I stumbled across this story about the conference of studio unions. And I should also mention that even before that, uh, when I did a book on the Civil Rights Congress, uh, which came out in the late 80s, believe it or not, I did research for that book at the Southern California Library as well. And that's probably when I first became familiar uh, with the story of the militancy of Hollywood unions. So it's easier for me to answer how I got into this uh, project as opposed to uh, why it has not become better known. I think it, I, I'll have to devolve to speculation <laughs> since I don't have a, I don't think I have a rigorous answer. Uh, I, I think it's, it's just like the way people view Los Angeles. Uh, in a very condescending manner, and which is very unfortunate because as we speak in early September, 2023, 160,000 actors and writers have been on the picket line for months now. They're challenging mega capital, including Disney, Amazon, Netflix, Fox, et cetera. Uh, this is an industry that helps to massage consciousness and shape consciousness, not only nationally, uh, but globally. And I should mention parenthetically that likewise in Southern California, in August, 2023, you had thousands of city workers engage in a one day strike to put pressure uh, on the Mayor of Los Angeles, Karen Bass, and City Hall. You've had a hotel worker strike. You've had job actions by teachers in recent months. And that has led some to conclude that really it's Southern California that's in the vanguard of labor generally in the United States of America, which you may not think that's saying too much given the state of labor. And as was once said in another context, that may be a distinction equivalent to being the tallest building in Topeka, Kansas, with all due respect to Topeka, Kansas. But still, uh, I, I think it, 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 it's nothing to sniff at when you talk about the uh, Citadel of Capital with those struggling against the Citadel of Capital disproportionately cited in one region, that is to say Southern California. But as I said, I think that for whatever reason, uh, Hollywood strikes are not taken seriously, which I think is a, a fundamental a political blunder, not only because of their role in challenging the titans of capital, not only because of uh, the product, so to speak, film, uh, being essential for the massaging of consciousness uh, up and down the class line, but also if you look at the subject of this book, Class Struggle in Hollywood, it deals not only with the kickoff of the so-called Red Scare, it's no accident as historians like to say that emerging from the ashes of the destruction of the Conference of Studio Unions was when Ronald Wilson Reagan, uh, who, as you know, becomes a notorious US president between 1980 and 1988. And even though um, Mr. Trump has not followed his legacy altogether, uh, he's still spoken of in hushed tones by not only members of the ruling class, but even, believe it or not, of those who may not be part of the ruling class. And then likewise, as I try to show in the book, there is a direct connection between the labor unrest in Hollywood and congressional investigations, not only of Hollywood, but of labor in general. 
which leads to the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which was a mighty blow against progressive unions generally in the United States, uh, among other things. It sought to purge not only communists from the leadership of unions, but class conscious workers from the leadership uh, of unions. And so I think it's important to take Hollywood seriously, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, it's unfortunate that I have to make that assertion because it should be intuitively obvious. And I should also say that this story is important as well uh, because of the role of organized crime. Uh, once again, as historians like to say, I don't think it's accidental that an entire genre uh, in Hollywood is focused on organized crime, mostly in terms of glorification. <laughs> uh, and as I used to say when I was speaking on this subject uh, quite a bit, Hollywood focuses on organized crime because Hollywood is infested by organized crime. Uh, just as in the music industry, uh, you've had this uh, phenomenon known as gangster rap, uh, which has led to <laughs> this allied phenomena in ordinary lingo in the United States, uh, Gangsta has become a verb, an adjective. It, it does a lot of work. Uh, likewise, uh, I don't think it's received enough comment that the term pimpin' has become a kind of compliment, believe it or not. You see it do a lot of work too with regard to ordinary discourse and lingo. And this comes not only out of the context of uh, uh, kind of glorification, if not ignoring, shall we say the downside of organized crime, but it also uh, speaks to something I've tried to address transnationally. Uh, that is to say the lump and proletariat. Uh, in, in this volume that'll be published shortly, uh, the Gerald Horn Reader edited by Tian Paris, a graduate student in, in Great Britain, I have an article I wrote decades ago. It was, in, it was during the time when I was immersed in all of this thinking about the uh, gangsters and organized crime and the entertainment industry, where I tried to explore not only how you have gangsters and organized crime in the entertainment industry transnationally, but also trying to unpack the concept of the lumpen. And I'm actually, I'm doing that now because I'm, I'm doing another book on Southern California dealing in part, in large part with the Panther Party. And as you know, the Panther Party, the Panther Party that we know at least, begins in Northern California circa 1966. And uh, they tend to glorify the Lumpen. It's their, their major singing group is called the Lumpen. And uh, you have former Panthers today who still glorify the Lumpen because they say that the Lumpen, uh, they'd rather punch the boss than punch a clock, <laughs> as one of them puts it, although they don't grapple with what happens after the boss hits the floor. <laughs> and so uh, the, this book, Class Struggle in Hollywood, is one of my first attempts in writing and book my form to deal with mobsters, which is part of the subtitle, because they play a major role in terms of bashing uh, unions uh, because of their role in terms of uh, as an auxiliary force for the moguls, the captains of in industry. And uh, they, uh, of course, in the United States, being a, a settler regime, uh, to, to go back to the historical exploration of the Lumpen, uh, we should not be shocked or surprised, uh, given the seamy and grimy origins of this country, uh, which in no small measure was built upon plunder and pillage, uh, plunder and pillage by gangsters. I mean, for example, look at the glorification of, of Jesse James, for example, the uh, pro-Confederate 
cutthroat and bank robber, for example. Uh, look at the fact that you have sports teams that are called pirates and buccaneers, for example. Uh, believe it or not, boys and girls in other societies, there's not necessarily glorification of pirates and buccaneers. Uh, that's a, a very essential U.S. thrust. And so uh, this book, I've spoken uh, perhaps too long on, on one aspect of this book, which is the role of the lump and the role of mobsters. But I should quickly pivot and say that this book is also about uh, unions, organized workers, particularly, as they say in Hollywood, the below the line workers, the carpenters, the set decorators, the electricians, the camera operators, et cetera. And there's also a story there that I don't get into until the tail end of the book, which is how there are self-inflicted wounds by these unions, because even today, Many of these unions are Jim Crow unions. Many of these unions uh, do not have a quotient of women members, uh, for example. And this is self-wounding. Uh, it helps to explain uh, why, despite the fact that the union in a blaze of glory uh, went out on strike in 1945 before the anti-fascist war had come to a crashing halt in the ashes of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, August 1945. And then we're subjected to a lockout. A lockout, for those who may not be familiar, <laughs> is when the bosses basically say, uh, see ya, <laughs> you're out of here. I mean, it's like a mass fire, basically. Uh, Ronald Wilson Reagan, of course, uh, administered a mighty blow against unions generally and the professional air traffic controllers more specifically in 1981, uh, when he basically locked them out. I mean, the, they went on on strike and he wouldn't negotiate, you know, he, he fired them all and then hired scabs to take their place. And coincidentally enough, uh, just a few days ago, the New York Times had a front page story about, oh, you've had all of these near misses on runways in the United States, because uh, I dare say that the air traffic controllers have yet to recover from the fact that these experienced controllers were all given their walking papers. And so I'm not trying to frighten anyone, but th there is a disaster waiting to happen to this very day on runways as planes <laughs> barely miss each other as they cross paths because perhaps these air traffic controllers are overworked as a legacy of the onerous labor conditions uh, authorized by Mr. Reagan, of course, a former head of the Screen Actors Guild, or uh, perhaps they're not as talented as they should be because they were not able to learn at the knee of those air traffic controllers who were subjected to a mass firing. So this is also a book about the labor, which is, is going uh, as ever uh, through a difficult period as we speak. And it's also a book about stars, which is a, a very interesting phenomenon. I mean, you might have seen the stories with regard to the current strike of the Screen Actors Guild tens of thousands of members, but then you have this typical U.S. phenomenon. You have a, a sliver who were able to, like Jennifer Aniston, to get a mansion in Bel Air, or like uh, Meryl Streep, uh, who lives quite well in Connecticut. And of course, uh, bless their hearts, uh, Streep, Clooney, George Clooney, who of course lives quite well in Italy, uh, Oprah Winfrey who lives quite well in Maui and in Montecito, amongst other sites, too numerous to mention. 
to their credit, they've made contributions uh, to the strikers. But uh, you have many people on the picket line right now uh, in Southern California, uh, even when there's not a strike, they have difficulty uh, paying their bills. And it's apparent that a la 1945, 1946, and thereafter, the bosses feel they can starve out <laughs> these, these workers. As a matter of fact, one of the bosses at the lack of diplomatic tact to say as much. But one positive aspect uh, comparing the past to the present is that Fran, Fran Drescher, who is the leader of the Screen Actors Guild, TV fans might recognize her or at least recognize her nasal voice, uh, as the actors were going out on strike, she gave a rip-roaring speech, uh, tripping with the authority of class struggle. And yet, that notwithstanding, uh, she was not red-baited. Nobody accused her of being a, a communist or communist dupe. And perhaps I should not have been surprised by that, but in a sense I was. And so I, I see that as, as a kind of step forward because Certainly, uh, anti-communism was wielded like a cudgel against these strikers in 1945. Uh, even though Herb Sorrell, the leader of the Conference of Studio Unions, they knew he wasn't a communist. He was just a militant trade unionist. But Disney, uh, earlier in the decade, earlier in the 1940s, had learned firsthand the value of anti-communism when they sought to disrupt a cartoonist strike. As you know, Disney gets a start in the 1920s uh, through developing the Mickey Mouse character. That's why this multi-billion dollar corporation is still called the, the Mouse House, so to speak. And Disney, of course, is now being confronted by strikers because they moved into film production uh, in a big way, moved into streaming in a big way. And they disrupted this cartoonist strike in the early 1940s by deftly wielding the tool that was anti-communism. And speaking of anti-communism, of course, uh, there were uh, communists uh, in the unions. As a matter of fact, uh, this, is, this is why it's useful to revisit topics because as I've said, I'm, I'm working on this book now in Southern California. And it's probably fair to say that uh, over the decades, uh, I would say from, let's say the Bolshevik revolution of 1917, uh, through the Red Scare, through the Black Panther Party, that California generally, Southern California specifically, was probably the center of left and radical resistance, much more so than New York, for example. I mean, in my introduction to my Panther book, and of course I, I deal with the precursors of the Panthers because, excuse this digression, but this is what I'm thinking about nowadays. Um, the Panthers have been written about as, as solely a province of the black power era. And certainly they were connected, to put it mildly, to that Black Power era. But it's no secret, it's, it's not a grand revelation that uh, George Jackson, the late George Jackson, the prisoner in the state of California, uh, he saw himself as a Marxist revolutionary, as did Huey Newton, as did a, a goodly number of the Panthers. I've oftentimes thought about how it is that sometimes scholars, if they're not Marxists, well then I guess they feel it's appropriate to elide the Marxism of people they're writing about. Or I'll, I'll just leave it there because for various uh, tactful reasons. But to give you one example, when you have the anti-communist trials in Los Angeles, 1951, 1952. The jury was out about a week before they came back with a guilty plea. I mean, with a 
a, a verdict of guilty. In New York in 1949, they were out for hours, for example. And I think what that speaks to is another point, which is that months before the Smith Act trial started, a, a communist had gotten 600,000 votes for a statewide office in the state of California. So in some ways, the Smith Act trials, the ruling class was locking up their opposition, which is basically what happened. And so I say all that to say that, uh, to punctuate the point that I was making, that you really have to take Southern California seriously as a site of radical resistance. You have to take Hollywood seriously as a site of radical resistance, not least because this star system allows for some to accumulate fabulous wealth, which as this current strike suggests, they then pour in to the coffers uh, of their union. And one of the points that I think uh, needs further exploration, and there has been a lot of writing about the star system, as to why and how you have these stars who orient themselves towards the left. Now, during this era, we would talk about James Cagney. Uh, we would talk about uh, Edward G. Robinson. Both of whom played gangsters, by the way, to return to yeah, as I'm glad to read the bumping that. discourse here. <laughs> you know, I, I had to say, I have to say <laughs> that uh, after the RICO indictment, Mr. Trump and his comrades in Atlanta. You can go on YouTube and see Edward G. Robinson in the final scene yeah. of Little Caesar. Mother of mercy, yeah. is this the end of Rico? Right. Of course, I haven't seen that headline. Where, where are these journalists? Come on, come on. That's, that's a natural headline. Someone needs to steal that headline from this interview. <laughs> <laughs> but and then, of course, this bleeds into anti-Semitism as well because um, it's no secret, uh, as the scholars like to say, that uh, when the film industry uh, migrates from New Jersey at the beginning of the 20th century to Southern California, and in part to escape the patents that had been developed in New Jersey and New York, and to go 3,000 miles away, and then of course the natural light, that um, many of the moguls or Jewish Americans, just like many of the stars, like Edward G. Robinson are Jewish Americans. And this uh, attracts the most venomous uh, anti-Semites. And then again, I, 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 as you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not just writing history. I'm trying to think about how this connects to the present. And I have to make this footnote, which is that this, this is a point that's been made by others, but not necessarily, I, I would say, on this precise point. The way that the site formerly known as Twitter is evolving has really become a, a cesspool of anti-Semitism. It, it's really remarkable. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out because we all know that you have a modicum of Jewish Americans and the ruling class in the United States. Many of them support the Anti-Defamation League. There's a hashtag now, ban ADL, which is attracting a lot of support. In fact, the last time I looked, uh, it attracted a, a support in Australia, for example. And so this, this is something to keep your eye on because man, too, many, too many people in this country, they accept the mythology of, of the ruling class. They really accept the mythology of whiteness, that is to say, not seen as some sort of con constructed identity, but it's something that's natural and inevitable, or, or I should say natural, like homo sapien, for example, which is, is, is not boys and girls. It's, it's a constructed identity, and which means that it can be uh, deconstructed, so to speak. In any case, anti-Semitism plays a role in my studies of Hollywood, uh, particularly with regard to the moguls and the stars, because the moguls come to fear that if they don't crack down on the left, that it will help to give sustenance to the nonsensical protocols of the elders of Zion, which is this anti-Jewish forgery 
that suggests that there is some sort of, among other things, this sort of, some, some, some sort of collaboration between the Jewish wealthy and Jewish radicals, uh, that they buried the hatchet. And the anti-Jewish bigots looking at Hollywood, seeing Jewish moguls at the top, Harry Cohn, Jack Warner, uh, as the saying goes, their roots are all from a very narrow area of Eastern Europe before they migrate uh, to the United States. And they see them on the one hand, and then they see these stars like James Cagney and, excuse me, I, I can't recall James Cagney, like Edward G. Robinson, yeah. I should say. Um, and not to mention the screenwriters, who are, of course is the subject of the other book. So maybe I, I, I've gone overboard in helping you to save your voice. So <laughs> I'll pause no. here. I uh, greatly appreciate you you doing so. Um, mm -hmm. you, you did touch on a lot of uh, questions that I had. I'm glad that you were able to, to pull all those threads together, uh, not only to save my voice, but to show how interrelated these mm -hmm. concepts and these ideas are that you're writing about and these eras that you're writing about. You just mentioned Harry Cohn. And there was a tidbit in the class struggle in Hollywood that I found particularly striking, and that was that Harry Cohn, of course, was uh, one, of the, one of the studio heads of Columbia Pictures. And when you write that, it was a story that he wanted Sammy Davis Jr. killed uh, right. for having a, an interracial affair with Kim Novak. He wanted right. some mobster to break his legs or whatever. Mm. But returning to that point, actually, because that was one of the final questions I had for you. I'm just going to jump to the end, actually. Uh, this idea that the, the lumpen the gangster class here in Hollywood was a political economic factor as well as a cultural uh, and aesthetic factor. And I, I wanted to ask you here, because um, I was thinking about that piece you wrote, um, me thinking of a lump of while I was reading Hollywood because they were, they were writing them contemporaneously perhaps. And uh, I was thinking about Trump, Julian, Roger Stone, this mm -hmm, sort of... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, some latter day gangster sort of ethos that they that they uh, have trump and, and i'm i'm interested in, in how these figures have a foot in the at least have had one foot in the entertainment industry for a uh, duration of their careers especially trump mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's been films and television as we know he was one of the uh, an early promoter of David Blaine, the magician, mm -hmm. if you remember. David Blaine buried himself underground for seven days at the foot of Trump Tower in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just interested in this. Uh, of course, Giuliani was on Seinfeld back in the 1990s and was on Dancing with the Stars. And so I'm very interested in, in again, this um, entanglement between the entertainment industry and the lumpen. And how should we rethink the lumpen today? Because you wrote that piece about 20 years ago, maybe more. How do we more. rethink more than 20? How do we rethink the lumpen in the era today of the rise of the right wing, the MAGA movement, and its foothold in the entertainment industry, or it's some of its main players have a foothold in the entertainment industry? Well, I can't recall if I said it in the piece, but I would analogize this stratum we refer to as the lumpen with, uh, believe it or not, the peasantry. Uh, that is to say, from our studies of the peasantry, we know that there are small peasants and big peasants. I mean, for example, if you look at, uh, at Mississippi, for example, or look at China pre-1949, uh, you had a plethora of small peasants. Whereas in certain parts of Eastern Europe, you have what might be called big peasants. Uh, that, and, and to draw an analogy, it, it would be uh, with another mode of production, such as uh, chattel slavery in the United States, uh, the masses of the 4 million enslaved as of 1860 uh, were, of course, unpaid workers by definition. Um, but uh, there were some 
who played sort of an overseer role. And of course, you, you, you could see this uh, in the Tarantino movie, uh, Quentin, Quentin Tarantino movie, uh, Django Unchained. The Samuel L. Jackson character, obviously, uh, within the context of slavery, is a cut above, shall we say, the mass of the four million, for example. And so likewise, with regard to the lumpen, I mean, <laughs> you got small lumpen and big lumpen. I mean, you could consider uh, Al Capone and John Gotti and all, all these other mobsters who the, the rappers valorize, well, at least certain rappers valorize and glorify. Uh, as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, you have rappers carry the name Gotti, Scarface, Bill Capone. Yeah. Sorry? Bill Seas. Bill right. Caesar. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's quite something. I mean, somebody... I mean, you're you're an English literature. Have people been writing about this sort of thing, this sort of parallel? You know, I, I'm actually not familiar. Uh, mm -hmm. I have to look into that after reading your rethinking the lumpen. Piece. It's, it's so obvious. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's glaring. And, and and not only that, but I mean, I don't know if you saw the movie Get Shorty with, with John Travolta. It, it it sort of illustrates my class struggle in Hollywood book because it's. It's a it's a book about how mobsters are financing uh, movies. As I, as I say in the, the class struggle book, uh, mobsters tend to be attracted to industries that throw off a lot of cash because it facilitates money laundering. That's why you see them in restaurant businesses so often. I mean, now of course nowadays people use credit cards. I'm talking about. You know, the 1930s and the 1940s, when cash was more prominent and prevalent than it is today. And um, before antitrust maneuvers, which interestingly enough, take place in the 1940s, you had a kind of vertical integration of Hollywood, that is to say controlling production and also exhibition. Exhibition meaning the movie theaters where more often than not, people are paying in cash uh, to enter. And so that throws off a lot of cash, uh, needless to say, as well, and which attracts the ravenous attention of what I would call the big lump. And so what's interesting today is that uh, there have been articles too numerous to mention about uh, how Donald J. Trump operates like a, man, uh, a mob boss. Uh, and th there, there's obviously something to that, for example. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm afraid to say we're going to find out uh, to our dismay that that comparison is more apt than many of us would like to think. <laughs> but less have we seen in terms of these journalistic uh, attempts to connect Mr. Trump to mobsterism is any sort of attempt to connect mobsters to the political economy of capitalism, to the political economy of imperialism. I mean, for example, a character in, in the class struggle book <laughs> is Johnny Roselli, uh, who is the mobs man in Hollywood, uh, who uh, of course uh, gets involved, or, 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 or I think I also mentioned Johnny Stampanato, uh, who you may recall, he captures headlines of the late 1950s when he's dating, as they say, Lana Turner, the Hollywood star, and her daughter stabs him to death, for example. And Johnny Roselli is the mob's man in Hollywood, uh, involved in various levels of uh, production, shall we say. And then, uh, he, I believe it's in the 1970s. It's in the book, which I don't have a copy here, but he, he's called before a congressional committee to testify about CIA activity. Because what happens is that the U.S. imperialism, U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, they like to use mobsters to do dirty work. And so just before he's summoned to appear before this congressional committee, his torso is found right. in an 
oil drum floating in some body of water. Presumably that means his legs are not still running around somewhere. <laughs> but what that illustrates, of course, once again, is the organic connection uh, between uh, mobsters and organized crime. That is to say, they're not a sideshow. Uh, it's It has a history, uh, given the role of pirates and buccaneers and delivering my ancestors to these shores, because uh, for the longest time, uh, the United States beginning in 1808, supposedly the slave trade was uh, illegal. Uh, which meant that as an illegal activity, it was made to order for pirates. But, e but even before it was officially illegal, uh, you had pirates in in investing in that form of odious commerce, uh, that form of the rudiments of capitalism, for example. And so we should not be shocked nor surprised that even today, particularly today, uh, you not only have this cultural miasma of gangsterism that pervades the atmosphere, we already made reference to how it's invaded our lingo and our discourse with regard to gangster. As a matter of fact, I, I saw a guy, a clip of a guy on Fox News. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, you saw that? Yeah. Where he says, Trump's indictment, he's, he's gangster. That means he's going to appeal to the black community. <laughs> That's no he's gangster. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't be laughing because... It's a ludicrous clip, of course, but there is a truth, a kernel of truth to it, right? <laughs> the joke is really on me. But, uh, uh, but, but as I said, I don't, I don't think the journalists have done a good job of connecting the dots. And I, I'm not even sure if the, the scholars have done a good job of, of connecting the dots as well. By your your piece on uh, rethinking the love, but I think it's so important to reconsider for today in this uh, situation uh, where that discourse is returning. It's already been here, of course, but it's returning. Mm -hmm. Speaking about figures like Donald Trump and Rudy, Rudy Giuliani and so on, um, and we're seeing it in, in mass media presentations of these trials and so on. Um, return, you know, let's 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 switch over to a different discourse. That's the discourse of red baiting. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had mentioned in your, in your first uh, your first answer uh, how you were kind of surprised that the discourse of red baiting hadn't returned when Fran Drescher gave her a passion speech, for instance, or I was surprised not to see it when uh, Brian Cranston mm -hmm. gave his presentation at, at a big uh, uh, a SAG event in, in uh, Hollywood. He played Dalton Trumbo, of course. Mm -hmm. film. Mm -hmm. So that's an already made sort of uh, discourse that could be at parasitically attached to him. But we are seeing that that anti-communist discourse arising with regard to films themselves, like the Barbie movie, for instance, which has been attacked by right-wing pundits as a feminist, Marxist, communist mm -hmm. propaganda film, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing it. Um, in, in that context. And most recently, I, I, I meant to mention this earlier, but um, SAG just uh, released a strike authorization for the video game industry, which is interesting because um, uh, apparently the writers in that industry are now authorized to participate in this movement, um, uh, which just extends the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the movement to a, a quite big arena video games, which some may argue are even, even bigger um, uh, in terms of audience than some films. I know that you just spoke recently with um, uh, Professor uh, Alyssa Seppenwall mm -hmm. mm -hmm. about her book on Haiti and video games, mm -hmm. Haiti and film and video games. Mm -hmm. And there were some parallels between her work and yours and this book. Some names, in fact, Daryl Zanuck being one of them. Mm -hmm. A producer in Hollywood. Um, but there was an overlap um, in Hollywood at this time, uh, not only of red baiting, anti communism, but an ever present anti blackness 
and fear of, uh, of uh, to, to borrow Leslie Alexander's book title, fear of a black republic, where films about Haiti, where it's impossible to produce films about Haiti unless they had certain stipulations met in the script, mm -hmm. like um, sympathetic white characters, for instance, things of that nature. But I thought that was interesting, uh, the way that the way this fear of Haiti and the Haitian revolution in film and this fear of communist of communism in the film industry kind of overlapped in that period. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you wanted to comment further on that. If not, I well, can. yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, it reminds me that there have been a number of intriguing Hollywood films dealing with the so-called blacklist. Uh, critiquing anti-communism. I think at the front, it's one of the few films Woody Allen has played in that he did not write nor direct. Although he plays uh, this character who fronts for a so-called blacklisted screenwriter. It's very interesting. The way we were with uh, Barbara Streisand and, and Robert Redford, a, a real trigger. As a matter of fact, I feel like breaking into the way we were now. But I, I'll spare your audience. But but you know a rather progressive film, and I, I could I could rattle off a number of films in that particular genre, and I, I say this because, as Professor Seppelin Wall points out, it's difficult to cite films dealing with the, the Haitian Revolution or, or 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 even slave revolts in general, and those that have dealt with slave revolts like Nate Parker's film. When Nat Turner, it would, it would sandbag uh, for right. various reasons, which need not detain us here. Um, and it reminds me of my own work because you know I, I started off in scholarship writing about anti-communism and it inevitably sort of went backward in time into, into slavery. And I've been saying for years now that it's harder to write in this country about slavery than it is about communists, believe it or not. And I, I think it's because folks, slavery is something that happened here. People made tremendous fortunes here. It contributed to a civil war leading to the shedding of an ocean of blood. Um, it continues to resonate as many journalists have pointed out, even today, for example is reflected in the fact that the bastion, the citadel of the right wing or in former slave states like Texas, for example. Whereas writing about communists and socialists, I mean, they haven't ruled the United States, believe it or not. And uh, despite what I said to begin our conversation, it's been a, a kind of minority movement politically, uh, so to speak, uh, although, uh, to reiterate, I, I think to a degree their strength has been underestimated. But having said that, it, it, it does point out something that I think needs more sober reflection, uh, which is something as noted that Professor Seppenwald points out, the, the difficulty in producing anti-slavery epics despite the fact that uh, the slave owners were defeated in war, although we know that they were able to recoup and, and in a sense uh, win the peace. And they're only being pushed back in the last few years following George Floyd's sling with the renaming of US military installations, stripping off the names of slave owners. Although in the Wall Street Journal just a few days ago, James Webb, a former democratic senator from the state of Virginia, has this had this tear jerking op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, singing the blues about renaming some Confederate memorial or stripping away a Confederate memorial. I think it's in Arlington, Virginia. So it, it, it's something to reflect upon soberly and, and, and what that may mean, particularly in terms of how this reluctance to confront slavery inevitably helps to bolster the right wing, which then uses anti-communism as a cudgel and a tool, uh, Mr. Cranston and Fran Drescher notwithstanding. And speaking of uh, 
Cranston, for those who, who may not be movie aficionados, and uh, uh, hopefully our conversation uh, can go beyond the cognoscenti, for example, Dalton Trumbo may have been the most talented screenwriter that Hollywood has produced to this point. Uh, I would point you to in particular uh, Spartacus, based on the Howard Fast novel starring uh, Kirk Douglas. Still one of, and that, that's, a, that's a stirring anti-slavery uh, epic, except it deals with slavery uh, in early Rome, as, as I recall. And of course, uh, a novelist, Johnny Got His Gun, still one of the more stirring uh, anti-war novels to be uh, produced at this time. And also with, with regard to Hollywood and the left, uh, in terms of my Black Panther story, uh, one of their all, most of their major funders, uh, other than the, the small funders taken collectively, uh, were from Hollywood. Uh, Bert Schneider, who was a Hollywood producer, I think uh, Days of Heaven, Easy Rider, were amongst his credits. He was the son of a head of a studio. Marlon Brando, uh, Bobby Seale, a founder of the Panthers, says that whenever they encountered Marlon Brando, the actor, you might recall him from On the Waterfront uh, with another scene you might want to look up on YouTube. You were my brother. You should have looked out for me. <laughs> but now I'm just a bum. You was my brother, Charlie. You should have looked out for me a little bit. You should have taken care of me just a little bit, so we'll have to take them dive for the short end of money. Well, I got some bets down for you. You saw some money. You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody. Instead of a bum, which is what I am. Let's face it. Marlon Brando would drop three thousand, five thousand dollars on the Panthers, and and then and you know thinking of my poor depiction of that Brando scene. It reminds me of how actors often talk about in order to really be a good actor, you have to be vulnerable. You have to have a certain kind of human empathy, which you can see how that builds a bridge to trying to alleviate suffering, mm -hmm. for example, which is one of the reasons why you see uh, so many people in the film industry uh, fund uh, the Black Panther, and of course Dalton Trumbo. He he made a he made regular contributions to the party, Black Panther Party. And in fact, during the Angela Davis trial, uh, when there was a fraught moment when uh, the prosecution thought that they had the defendant pinned into a corner because of some letters she had written to George Jackson, which were going to be used to show uh, how her passion for Jackson led her to be involved, it was said by the prosecution in an attempt to free him. The defense, defense counsel turned to Dalton Trumbo <laughs> to get uh, a sort of rationale for these letters. And, and, and then of course he came through, that'll be in the book by the way. And so um, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's really something to, to contemplate the, the importance of this industry. But then again, this industry uh, might be going through a transition. You might have seen the article the other day where Charter Communications, a, a major, a major uh, cable company, says that uh, the whole cable in industry is, is in a sort of doom loop that implicates Disney, a major producer of films, because they control both uh, ABC and ESPN. And I think that there's something to that. Disney, of course, is in a spat right now with Governor DeSantis in Florida. And that speaks to something else that I don't think the left has paid sufficient attention to, which is that what we may be seeing right now, and I, I underline may because it's, it's too soon to tell, is an attempt to force certain ruling class elements into a corner, believe it or not, like Disney in Florida. Uh, I, I think that ultimately some of the US corporations involved in China are gonna have to take a haircut. And we're talking about uh, Apple. Interestingly enough, Tesla, which is helping to whip up this right-wing sentiment 
might find it bites it in, in the behind since it's a, a major investor in China. I, I hope Elon has thought that through, although somehow I don't think so. Alpha, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, th 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 these kinds of changes uh, we have to pay attention to because it reminds me uh, of Mr. Trump's favorite president, Andrew Jackson, uh, because during that time, you had a number of uh, Native American leaders who thought that they were integrating into the U.S. ruling class. I'm talking about the late 1820s. Um, but then, of course, uh, the Cherokees who, in the state of, of Georgia, many of them had converted to Christianity. They had become sedentary agriculturalists. They'd even in, invested in slave Africans. They still had to go. <laughs> you know, and uh, they still were expropriated. And interestingly enough, uh, to connect these threads, Leo Branton, who was Angela Davis's lawyer, he was lawyer for the Smith Act trial in Los Angeles, 1951-1952. He was lawyer for Nat King Cole, the pianist and vocalist, a really black man with a television show, the lawyer for the estate of Jimi Hendrix, the guitarist. Uh, a mentor of Johnny Cochran, the lawyer in the O.J. Simpson case, in the Toronto and Park case. So Leo Branton, he's defined and constructed as Black, although if you look at him on Google Images, you'll see uh, he's very melanin deficient. He apparently was a descendant of Greenwood LaFleur, who was a slave-owning Choctaw, a major slave owner in Mississippi, believe it or not, in the 1820s and 1830s. Many of the Choctaws were forced to move, like the Cherokees in Georgia, to Oklahoma, Indian Territory. Apparently, Greenwood LaFleur was able to cut a deal and stayed on and was sort of accepted as part of the uh, slave-owning elite. And of course, Leo, Leo Breton was also a lawyer for the Little Rock Nine, 1957, Little Rock, during the desegregation crisis, because his roots were in Arkansas, the neighbor of Mississippi. So, um, it's interesting how all of these threads uh, sort of connect. And uh, certainly we, we need to connect more threads if we're going to dig ourselves out of this crisis we now find ourselves in. Right. Yeah, no, I can only wholly agree to that. Speaking of the South, I want to talk a little bit about John Howard Lawson. And the mm -hmm. reason I say speaking of the South was because John Howard Lawson, the, the dean of the Hollywood Ten, the final victim of the blacklist, as you put it, the so-called Stalin of Hollywood, comrade of John Dos Passos, of Paul Robeson, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Trumbo, and so on. Uh, he, he, he uh, like Ben Davis, I guess, in a way, was spurred on to uh, commitment to communism by the Communist Party by visiting uh, the South and in the time of mm -hmm. Andrew mm -hmm. Herndon and the Scottsboro mm -hmm. Post. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Lawson and as a screenwriter, as a playwright first, and then a screenwriter, and how this, this, this moment of racial unrest in the South really galvanized and uh, forged his, uh, his politics. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, let me say that John Howard Lawson was Jewish American, so therefore uh, he is symbolic of the uh, anti-Semitic anti-communist hysteria. As a matter of fact, I made the point earlier, but I'm going to make it in this uh, Panther book, because the book also deals with communists and Black nationalists and liberals like the NAACP, which is that uh, early on, the Communist Party was disproportionately comprised of Jewish Americans, like John Howard Lawson. But what happens is, in a, in a sense, it, it happens not only to uh, Black Americans, but if you look at the slogan coming out of Guatemala in the 1950s, Rijoles y Fusiles, you know, beans and rifles. Either take the beans or you get the rifle. And so a, a turning point comes with the Rosenberg case uh, when the Jewish American communists are executed, liquidated because of this fallacy that somehow they were collaborating on the atomic bomb with uh, Moscow. And, uh, you know, as, as I said in my slavery studies, you only have to beat one slave to keep the entire plantation in line. 
you only have to execute a couple of Jewish Americans to get people to say, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe we need to rethink the, the, this, this project. But John Howard Lawson, uh, who is from an affluent family, uh, participates in World War I, like many of the so-called lost generation, uh, Hemingway, for example, if I'm not mistaken, uh, migrates to Broadway, and then as talking pictures, so-called, take off like a rocket with the production of the jazz singer with uh, Al Jolson, which of course has been <laughs> analyzed to a fairly well by scholars, uh, given how it deals with blackface and some of the, the, the scenes in that movie are, are really something. It's almost like they made it with a future generation of deconstructionists in mind, for example. They're, they're, they're really something, some of the scenes. But in any case, uh, that leads to a takeoff of the movie industry. You have many dramatists migrating, like Lawson, uh, to Southern California to come up with scripts. William Faulkner, for example, does a stint uh, in Hollywood as well. And so uh, Lawson, he writes a number of uh, worthy scripts, including Sahara, which is one of the uh, early movies in Hollywood that has sort of a sympathetic, humane Black character. And as a matter of fact, it, it's, it's interesting to compare the Black character in Sahara by John Howard Lawson with that in Watch on the Rhine, which I only watched about a year ago. This is the uh, Lee and Hellman. Lee and Hellman, of course, was part of the left. Most, some might recall her because of her relationship with Dashiell Hammett, the thin man, and uh, his novels, et cetera. Uh, Lawson's black character is certainly more humane and more well-rounded than the rather stereotype black character in Watch on the Rhine. Although Watch on the Rhine is interesting. I mean, you know, I'm, like, I'm not going to dismiss that movie altogether, but you know, she stumbles in, in terms of black characterizations. And in, in any case, uh, he does Algiers, uh, Blockade. He helps the film what is now the Writers Guild, uh, one of the early attempts to unionize uh, in Hollywood. Interestingly enough, even today, uh, the writers are more militant than the directors, for example. And uh, I have my, you know, the directors are not on the picket line. They, they cut a deal, as you may know. And it's interesting too that, that uh, you go to Los Angeles, the, the director's guild headquarters is an architectural marvel. Not the writer's building, not so much. I wouldn't call it an architectural marvel. But I think that it bespeaks how the writers, I think, are feared more, in my estimation, by the moguls than the directors. Because I haven't done a study but you could probably show that you have more actors like Denzel Washington, for example, migrating into directing. I think he directed The Great Debaters, for example, which is a very good film, by the way. Uh, once again, it, it has a, a sympathetic uh, communist character, interestingly enough, uh, as opposed to actors migrating into writing. Now you've had some of that um, but in any case, uh, John Howard Lawson, uh, like many communists that are riding high <laughs> as a result of the anti-fascist war, the United States and the Soviet Union in alliance against uh, Germany, Italy, and Japan. But as World War II comes to a halt, the worm turns, and before you know it, uh, they're all before congressional committees. Uh, one of John Howard Lawson's last writing assignments is the screenplay for uh, Cry the Beloved Country, perhaps the first uh, anti-apartheid epic. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, with Sidney Poitier and Canada Lee, Canada Lee being the black actor who also runs afoul of McCarthyism. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. I mean, 
obviously I have certain qualms about it, but it, 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 it's it's worth saying. But I would also recommend, speaking of John Howard Lawson, his book, The Hidden Heritage. You, you in particular in English literature should, should read that book. It, it's it's a sort of a, a, a sweeping analysis, radical analysis of English literature from pre-Shakespeare era up until the 20th century. That's how one of the ways he occupied his time when he couldn't uh, get screenwriting gigs, for example. I think it still might be in print, but certainly it, it can be obtained through interlibrary loan. Um, it, it's sort of sad what happens to Lawson in the sense that uh, he's during the McCarthy period, he, he's a real ideological outlier. He's, quote, blacklisted, unquote, finding it difficult to get gigs. It's, it's a very uh, unfortunate story before he passes away in the 1970s. And he's brought low, among other things, by Parkinson's. Thank you for that, uh, a little bit of that history of John Howard Lawson, who was a figure I'd never heard of, in fact, before I read your uh, Class Struggle in Hollywood book, in which, of course, he's a major character. Mm -hmm. um, but you said something at the beginning of, when you write something at the beginning of uh, Class Struggle in Hollywood, I found this very striking. Um, you, you argue that one's intellectual grasp of a film or of films in general cannot be reached, quote, this is a quote, absent an understanding of the basic relations of production within the film history. And you're basically, I think, arguing that uh, the idea of textual analysis, of analyzing films, uh, interpreting films, we can't really get a firm grasp of, of what a film's about unless we understand the political economic basis in which these films are made. And you spend a lot of time in your book doing that sort of work, of course, you talk about these uh, jurisdictional disputes, for instance, between the unions, which carpenters can come in to build sets, which painters of which unions can come. If, one, if, if some are on strike, no one can come paint the sets, for instance. And that really starts to change the shape of, of the actual aesthetic shape of these films. Uh, and I thought that was a really interesting argument you're making because in film theory, film criticism, a field that I, I've, I've, I've worked with in a bit. That's some, that's very, uh, that's not something you hear every day, let me put it that way. The idea that the political economic history of, of the film industry should, should be front and center. So I wonder if you could elaborate on that idea just a bit. But you know, it's interesting. I was just reading a review of a new book on um, by a professor in London about uh, Shakespeare and racism and She's talking about contemporary Shakespearean productions and lighting and how the lighting of the stage can oftentimes operate, should be obvious, to the detriment of darker skinned figures, for example. And I think I mentioned this in the class struggle book that if the crew, if the folks operating the camera and the lighting, for example, are unsympathetic, shall we say, to the actor, it can lead to a mangling of how they come across on the silver screen. And I was thinking about this as well in the context of the strike. Uh, which is once again is unfolding as we speak. And I, some of the stars have worked out these side deals with the Screen Actors Guild SAG that allows them to continue acting in movies that supposedly do not implicate the big dolls, Amazon, Netflix, Disney, Warners, et cetera. Although I noticed that Viola Davis, the actor, she had a side deal to play the president of the United States uh, in a movie called G20, which was going to film in South Africa. She backed out because, you know, she, 
because Sarah Silver, amongst others, have complained about these side deals because they, they see it. Because, you know, it doesn't take a genius <laughs> to figure out. Then, you know, Disney and Amazon, they, they might set up shell independent companies that supposedly are not tied to Amazon <laughs> or Disney so that they can keep pumping up out product. And I was thinking that some of the actors uh, and some of the stars are probably thinking about their relationship with the below the line crew, because if they're perceived as scabs, then they might have trouble getting uh, lighting. There, there are already complaints about uh, in terms of television and, and also streaming, how sometimes you can hardly understand uh, what actors are saying. Yeah. And maybe it's some sort of technical flaw that they haven't sorted out. Uh, or maybe it has something to do with what I'm hinting at. Uh, that, that is, Brian X. Chin had a piece in the New York Times just a few days ago about the diff and how, how it's led to something that the U.S. audience blanches at, which is having subtitles. The U.S. audience, they don't like subtitles. <laughs> but um, it, it, it's something that needs further elaboration. And, and as we're talking, I'm thinking about the value of specializing in one area, which I haven't done, obviously. Because if if I had, well, it's too late now, <laughs> but if I had specialized in one area, this is something that, that I would have liked to have explored um, more deeply, as opposed to just sort of throwing out a thought and then just leaving it hanging there and then not going more deeply into it and depending upon others to go deeply into it, uh, which I guess is an overestimation. Well, I mean, you, you did drop a bomb, to put it that way, on, on those opening pages of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, before picking up on it 20 plus years later, at this point, during a writer's strike, a major writer's strike, I think it's the right time to mm -hmm. reconsider it. And uh, I've certainly feel like I've picked up uh, the torch that you laid down. So maybe that's something I'll uh, try to explore here. Good, um, good. But thank you, Dr. Horn, for a, for a wonderful uh, interview on these fascinating books of yours. Um, as, usual, as, as usual, we're very excited to see the book projects you have coming out. I know you've mentioned your Black Panther book and the Indonesia book. And then Tian has a book, the Gerald Horn Reader, coming out in a couple months. And then Chris Steele and you have a book coming out at the end of the year. Is that right? No, it'll be in a few days. Oh, in a few days. Wonderful. And then maybe this is the right time to announce that you and I also have a volume coming out, uh, probably in 2024, which is an edited volume of, of these uh, some of these conversations we've had. So that's something to look out for too in the future. 